but we're on a tricky subject you know <laughs> and i'm i'm going to go ahead and dive right in if it turns into hell's fire so be it and if it turns into the flood so be it. i don't care you mentioned that in your forays in the tech space as a woman a lot of times you weren't taken seriously so how and i know that you handled it by you know putting your head down and getting to work so you can prove them wrong but what was it like and if you could tell us a story or two of what you came across that you felt in that moment because you were a woman in that space that was male dominated mm. you didn't feel like you were as appreciated or as respected as you should have been it, it was it's constantly you're constantly getting comments like that or you know the comment where um, the b word where you get a oh, women get called that all the time you know when we're asking for something or we're being assertive and we're saying no we need you to do this now and we have a tone we're automatically you know a b uh meanwhile when a man is assertive and says no i need you to go, go do this now they're being bought how did mm-hmm. you cope with the emotional strain of being <sighs> ill with such a major illness and didn't you at times this is a sensitive question but i have to ask because someone could be listening faced with a similar situation and you're looking for answers didn't you also at time feel afraid that maybe this was going to be it i just felt like because it was i mean at the time i believe there was like 35 people at this company and there was only like three women wow. so i knew and it was a very boys club you know at lunch time mm-hmm. they would all go out and play squash and it was it was a very boys club but i i just I I just knew that if in order for me to get anywhere I had to prove myself and that was just my way of going about it. I'm not saying it's the right way for for everyone. That's what worked for me because that also goes with my personality. Hey guys, welcome to the Boardroom podcast. Today we have a wonderful a special guest with us we have one Sonia Kuto is it correct yes Sonia how are you doing today i'm great how are you i'm doing well it's been a wonderful day so far very productive and it's only 10 a.m. so you know it's going to be a good day <laughs> um i was looking forward to this interview i was looking forward to having a sit down with you mm-hmm. because you have a story to tell that the world needs to hear and for our listeners just tuning in When I say that I mean breast cancer survivor double mastectomy. Mhm. But you're also a female in the space of technology. You're also a director, entrepreneur mm-hmm. at heart, and I'm quite amazed when I read your bio <laughs> of how much you've achieved, how much you've been through, and I'm hoping that your story today can inspire someone to do something amazing with their life. Thank you. I appreciate that. In a in a in a nutshell, really, mm-hmm. when we meet Sonia Kuto, so let's say that a friend of mine has come over. You and I are having a talk. A friend of mine has come over, and I say to my friend, "You know what? I'd like you to meet Sonia." And I say to my friend, "Friend, this is Sonia. Sonia, this is friend. Who exactly is my friend meeting when he meets Sonia Kuto at this time?" <laughs> I think you're meeting someone who's authentic, genuine. uh friendly open to um conversations learning and just always being a better version of myself. Oh. So someone who is very in tune with who you are, your limits and surpassing those limits, we might add. Yeah. It's Sounds been a work good. in progress, but you know, I'm mm-hmm. still working on those things. <laughs> and as you say it's a work in progress. I've believed that's what life is like. What is mm-hmm. like the biggest thing that you've learned from the year 2023? Oh, man. 20, mm. 2023 was was a good year for me. I feel like it was a mm-hmm. a year of growth. I was able mm-hmm. to put a lot of things that I was sort of dealing with in my my brain uh, aside and I was able to really move forward in a lot of things that I wanted to achieve, get over. I think 2023 was a cleanup year. Mhm. clean up year. I was a good year. Yeah. Get over yeah, some things. It was a things. good year. Did yeah. you start anything new, anything exciting that you'd like to share with us? Well, I started a new podcast. <laughs> Ooh. Yeah, podcast yeah. right now. Tell yeah. us more. 
Yeah, so I started a, a podcast called Tenacity with Sonia C. It just launched in mm -hmm. January, but I started planning for it last year. And it's really mm -hmm. a podcast about uh, having conversations with leaders who have been through the entrepreneurial uh, journey and are now giving back to young entrepreneurs and founders who want to be where they are but can learn from their lessons and their failures and a lot of the things that they've already been through and not have to go through it themselves, hopefully. I think that's, <laughs> I think that's a brilliant idea. One of the things that we realize happened in the world of entrepreneurship, which is why we also started the Boardroom Podcast on Zelhan, is if you knew what you should do and what you should not do when you were starting out, it would save you potentially years of failure and heartache. So yeah. I applaud yeah. your effort. You are... You are very influential, I would say, because you're a woman in tech. What exactly is that like? Because it's a male-dominated industry, and you've carved out an, impress an impressive career, mind you. So what is it like to be a woman in tech? And how can someone listening today, a young female, actually get, their self, get themselves a foot in the door in one of the leading tech companies in the world? What do they do? Yeah, I mean, I think... Before I, I, I say what you do, I think it's different for everyone based on your personality and your mm -hmm. your belief system and, 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 and just who you are as a person. For me, I am very tenacious. I'm the middle child of five kids. So I'm used to, you know, being scrappy and finding my way. I'm also an immigrant in this country. I came here very young, not knowing how to speak any English. So I think being scrappy is just part of who I am. Um, mm -hmm. you know, nothing has ever been handed to me. I had to sort of like work for, for everything I have needed, wanted and things like that. So I think that's part of my personality. So when I got into tech, it was sort of by an accident. Um, I had been in the operations uh, side of uh, my career in manufacturing. And when I got into tech, I sort of got into it for accounting and operations. But I'm not the type of person who's going to sit around and just do the same job over and over again and be a robot. I'm curious naturally. So when I got into this tech company, my curiosity uh, got the best of me. I started asking questions. I started um, getting involved in things that had nothing to do with my job role. And then I started, I started um, suggesting improvements and things that they could work on to improve certain parts of, of the business. And I started getting a lot more and more and more involved in I started showing that there were areas that they had never really considered that I was looking at and that there was room for improvement. And I just, I just sort of like put my way in. Now I did, I was working with people that were open to my suggestions and willing to, to work with me, which that helps if you have a team that's not biased and they want uh, that. But I think, I, I think it was just about me being, putting myself out there and, and saying, hey, I'm here, I see these things, I want to help. And that sort of helped me build myself up. I pretty much at one point did almost every single role in the company. Wow. And so that when an opportunity, yeah. And so that was actually really good for me because an opportunity came where the original founder of the company sold it uh, to a VC. And um, they asked me to run the business because I knew the business so well. And that's where I'm the managing director now. Oh, so yeah. I'm hearing something that's quite, I believe it's interesting and I believe it's also revealing. You said scrappy mm -hmm. in that nothing <laughs> has ever been handed to you easily. You had to work for it. You had to, as I say, kick butt to get there. And the reason why I say this is interesting and it's revealing it's almost as if the people who are successful in life, they're the ones who've never taken no for an answer. Mm. And I find that perhaps that's, I don't know, I'm speculating that that is one of the main reasons why we have so many self-made millionaires today. Like the last statistic I heard was like over 70% of the self-made millionaires in America, 70% of the millionaires in America are self-made. And the reason why I bring that up is because I want to put it out there that it doesn't matter your background, it doesn't matter the cards that you've been dealt with, it doesn't matter the situation that you have. If you want to be successful and you're willing to work for it, if you're willing to not give up at the first or second sign of failure or things not working out, I believe you can make it. You mentioned that you, you've held 
almost every role in that company before it mm. got sold. And when it got sold, you were the person that they turned to to run the business. Is it possible for you to tell us the name of the business and what it does? Yeah, it's called Converge Digital Solutions, Converge with a K, and it's a software development company in Toronto, oh. Canada. Ooh. Yeah. My friend lives in Toronto. <laughs> and what are some of the roles, the tech roles that you've held at this company? So when I started out, I was in accounting and then I moved into operations. So I was uh, operations manager. When I was operations manager, I started, that's when I started getting into other roles and helping out. So I started doing business analysis. I did a lot of project management and then I got promoted to uh, operations, uh, director of operations. And then I got into product management. And product management was really the role that helped me eventually down the road build two tech startups because project management and product management are two very different roles. And then, of course, I also did a lot of uh, QA, so, so testing software, um, marketing, accounting is my background. With this company, what I did was something that they, did not in the, they didn't have in the past was they kept operations and accounting separate. So the two were not speaking to each other. And my background in manufacturing was accounting and operations together. So I was able to, to come in and figure out where we needed to cut costs, where we could offshore some of our work, where we could really streamline the work we were doing and be profitable. So that really helped us get to the next level where we needed to be in, in the business. And it was just a matter of, Someone left the company and we needed to fill that role. And I would say, can I fill that role until you guys find someone? And I would work on a project. And, on an, and, and while I was working on that project, I was learning from the people who knew. And I was able to do a couple of projects. I mean, I didn't work on these for like five, six years. I would do it up for a couple of months at a time. But now being in the position that I am, I know Every single role that I'm hiring for, I know what they're doing. I know what that role consists of. When they need help, I can step in and help them problem solve. So I'm very hands-on when it comes to the business in every department, in every role. I love that story. And I love the tenacity that mm -hmm. is being displayed here. And the thing that the thing that really amazes me about it, it's not like it's amazing in the sense of, oh, I can't believe it, but amazing in the sense that, yeah, you actually did that is even something that was not up your alley. Now, I know you were into accounting, so accounting is a bit of math. And if you were to go into tech, you need to have some yeah. math knowledge or understanding of math. But to just go crossways, sideways like that, eventually go into Q&A, that's testing and so on, until eventually you're a project manager, that's quite amazing because it shows that you're not only talking about what needs to be done. You've actually walked the talk, yeah. as they put it. I love that because also, as you say, you know, whenever you need to hire someone, it's not a matter of reading a resume and hoping that this is the right person for the job. You know exactly what it means, yeah. the soft skills and the hard skills. You know exactly the challenges that they might face with. And at times, if yeah. necessary, you can fit in. Isn't that what small business entrepreneurship is really about? You can't know everything, but you can be familiar <laughs> enough to make yeah. an informed decision about everything, no? I, yes, I, I do agree with that. I think for me, part of the reason why I did that was because I was mm -hmm. a woman in tech. And I don't think that at the time I was taken as seriously as I wanted to. So the reason I went down that route was my way of saying, I'm going to prove to you that I can do this. And I can't mm -hmm. prove it to you by showing you my resume. I'm going to prove it to you by actually doing the work and showing you that I can do it, that I am the right person for the role, that I can do these things, mm -hmm. right? And, and I am very hands-on just in naturally. I'm also a visual learner. So I learn quickly when I'm actually doing something versus reading a book. Um, so I just felt like if I wanted to grow within this company or any company I've been at it for that matter, I just felt like, because it was, I mean, at the time, I believe there was like 35 people at this company and there was only like three women. Wow. So I knew, and it was a very boys club, you know, at lunchtime, mm -hmm. they would all go out and play squash and it was, it was a very boys club, but I, I just, mm -hmm. I, I just knew that if in order for me to get anywhere, I had to prove myself. And that was just my way of going about it. I'm not saying it's the right way for, for everyone. 
that's what worked for me because that also goes with my personality. Mm -hmm. But have you ever seen someone that was laid back and kind of take it as it comes, actually make it in any yeah. space at all? No, I uh, can't say that I have. <laughs> uh, exactly, right? I, it doesn't matter what your resources are. If you're not willing yeah. to put in the work, you're eventually going to fall. There is a gentleman by the name of Patrick Bet David. Are you familiar with him? No. So Patrick Bet David, like yourself, is an immigrant. He lives in America now. He's American. He has citizenship and everything. But he grew up in war-torn Iran. He okay. fled from Iran with his family at the age of 10 to refugee camps in Germany, left from Germany, came to America at the age of 11, I believe. And when he was about to leave high school, he went, to the ar- went into the army. Why did he go into the army? His GPA in high school was 1.8. And they said that he had to take the safe route, join the army, become a policeman, become a, fire- a fireman, get um, put in like 20, 25 years of service, get a pension, and that would be it. Now his word over. The last time I looked, which is over a year ago, it was a net worth of $180 million. Oh, the reason wow. why I say this is because... I know, right? The reason <laughs> why I say this is because he... By the way, he has one of the biggest and most impressive YouTube channels for entrepreneurs, Valuetainment. Oh, I'll have to check him out. Yeah, he's really good. The reason why I bring up Patrick's story is because Patrick has this mantra that he always says over and over and over. Outwork, so you have to work more than your competitors. Outlast, Mm. so you can't just outwork them for a day or a week or a month. You have to do it for a decade, two decades. So you outwork, outlast, out improve so as you work harder and you do it longer than them you get better than them and you have to out strategize you can't just be hitting the nail you have to find the best way to hit the nail you have to find the best way to execute and that i believe is a recipe a formula for success i'm pretty sure that you can attest to that you mentioned that in your forays in the tech space as a woman a lot of times you weren't taken seriously so how and i know that you handled it by you know putting your head down and get into work so you can prove them wrong. But what was it like? And if you could tell us a story or two of what you came across that you felt in that moment, because you were a woman in that space that was male dominated, Mm. you didn't feel like you were as appreciated or as respected as you should have been. Yeah. There's always this one story that I I say, and it's, it's something that just has stuck with me. Um, I had a, I'll just give you an example. I had a a situation years ago where I had to, we we were having problems with a a project and the client wanted to set up a meeting and and go through and review everything so we could, you know, sort of restructure how we were going to, you know, go about it to to wrap it up. And so Mm -hmm. the people that were on the project couldn't make it because of family obligations, whatever it was. So they asked me to step in and go into this project and take care of it. And I remember I was really stressed out about it because I wasn't involved in this project on a day-to-day basis. So I was kind of like stepping in at this point to fix the problem. And I was trying to get ramped up and I was trying to understand where everything was so that I could step in and really, you know, work with the client to to get it resolved. And uh, I remember I was with one of my my bosses or mentors at the time and I was I was stressed out I was stressing out this was a a massive company all males this is the space that we were in (laughs) and I remember one thing that he said to me and it's not you know I don't hate him for it or anything him and I are still really good friends but it was just a comment that just stuck with me and I remember because it devalued how what I was trying to do and how I was feeling and, and because I was working so hard to try and ramp up on this project, he said, worry about anything. He's like, here's what I'm going to suggest to you. And I'm like, okay, tell me. I, I, need to, I, need, I need to know as much as I can. And he's like, just make sure that when you walk into that boardroom, you're wearing heels and everything else will be fine. And, you know, I was like, okay, you know, great. That's like, that's fantastic advice. Like, you know, I'm really going to solve all the problems by wearing heels. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's sort of like Mm -hmm. that mentality and it's such a small comment, but it's, it it was, it's constantly, you're constantly getting comments like that. Or, you know, the comment where um, the B word, where you get a woman get called that all the time, you know, when we're 
asking for something or we're being assertive and we're saying, no, we need you to do this now. And we have a tone. We're automatically, you know, a B. Uh, meanwhile, when a man is assertive and says, no, I need you to go, go do this now. They're being a boss. <laughs> you know, but, they're a boss. <laughs> So it's just it's just those kind of things that I, I've just I've had to deal with on on a regular basis. And then, of course, there's, you know, going to tech events and, you know, having inappropriate comments made. It's just it's something that I'm so um, like I've grown really thick skin around it. I, I, I tell myself that I have crocodile skin. <laughs> so to me, I'm a little numb to it because I'm so used to it. But I do think the space mm-hmm. is getting a little bit better some, you know, male leaders yeah. are, are stepping up and, and trying to really, you know, be a lot more uh, diverse. But, but I think it's going to take a, a while for the space to really be 50-50. I think it's 13 now percent women based in tech. 13 percent women in I tech. I think. I don't know if it's changed in, in the last year. But last time I checked, I think it was between 11 to 13 percent. But we're on a tricky subject, you know. <laughs> and I'm I'm going to go ahead and dive right in. If it turns into hell's fire, so be it. And if it turns into the flood, so be it. I don't care. Let's have a conversation about women in tech, the disparity sure. between men and women in tech and all of that. <laughs> and just as a disclaimer, I was engaged to a girl that finished summa cum laude in the computer science department at the university mm. that we went to. She and her friend finished summa cum laude, both of them. I don't know how they did it. Best friends, man, you. Two, two girls. So it's not like I'm discrediting women in tech. But what I want to ask you, and I'm going to ask this before I give my opinion on it. Okay. Do you think that there's an overarching reason why there's such a disparity between the number of men and women who take up careers in tech? Is, is it because, oh, well, I don't know, because, you know, I'm in Jamaica, mind you. I've not lived in America or studied mm. in America or Canada or any other major country to make an informed comment on this. But do you think it's that educational system that pushes men and women into different careers? Is it just a gender-based thing? Is it, I don't know, is there some sort of phobia attached? Because like you said, if you're assertive, you're a B word. And if a man's assertive, he's another B word, a boss apparently. So what do you think is the reason for that? Yeah. I mean, this is my own personal opinion. It's not based on any statistics or anything like that. I think it is the school mm-hmm. system. I think our, our school really? system is very traditional. It has not pivoted or changed at all. And I think mm-hmm. that it doesn't encourage um, men and women to go into different roles. Like if you look at nursing, for example, it's a very female-dominated industry. And when you meet mm-hmm. men that are nurses they are looked at a little weird, especially in North America. It's getting a little better. But I remember in the beginning, if a man said, I'm a male nurse, I mean, there's a whole movie making fun of them, uh, which is Meet the Fockers, really? right? Where the, 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 oh, the girl's... Oh, that's what that is? Yeah, oh. the girl's husband is a, is a nurse, and they're constantly making fun of them. So mm-hmm. um, I think it's the education system. It's very traditional. You know, policemen were... It's called police men, not police people, right? Fire men, not fire people or fire women. And you know what I mean? So I, I do think that it at the education and, and when I say education system, I'm talking like at the elementary school level, you know, encouraging kids to explore whatever type of career they might want, but, but create a, create a curriculum that encourages, you know, science, um, technology for anybody. I think it's mostly geared towards men because that's just mm-hmm. how they're educated. I, I, I'm, I'm actually on the board of um, an organization called Hacker Gals. And Hacker, Hacker Gals? Gals ha- Hacker Gals. Oh, okay, okay, cool, cool. And it is a uh, nonprofit organization that goes into the elementary schools at the grade six level and teaches girls how to code so that mm-hmm. when they get to high school, they will know whether they enjoy, you know, coding and if it's something that they want to get into and explore more in high school so that when they're getting ready to look at universities and things like that, they might they they will have taken the courses in high school that will help them get into the MITs and the computer science programs. 
Now, starting mm-hmm. girls out at the grade six level elementary helps them prepare so that they have those thoughts in their mind at, in, in high school saying, I really like to code. What courses do I need to take in high school in order to, you know, give me what I need, the credentials that I need to, to get into a career like this? So it's just putting those thoughts in their head at a very young age that, hey, this is a possibility for you. You can do this. And they train them. And it's a whole, it's a beautiful program. And I think that's exactly what needs to happen more in schools. I mean, I think there there should be a, politi- uh, a, a science program. I think a lot of schools are starting to develop that. But I still think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. But I do think it starts at the education level, to answer your question. All right. So let's assume that it starts at the education level. Do you think that if we have two candidates... Um, we have two candidates before us. So there's one paper in my left and one paper in my right hand. You guys can't see my hand, but I do have hands right here. And <laughs> in my left hand is a candidate for a female and there's a candidate for a male. Exact. Um, so it's the same GPA. So they're both college graduates, same work experience, same credentials. And there's only one position available. In your honest opinion, who do you think gets the job? It's hard for me to answer that question because when I'm hiring, I'm based on who's the best person for the job based on experience. If I was looking at a resume, me this is just me personally. I'm not judging anyone. If I was looking at a resume for a computer science engineer and I had two resumes and I didn't know if they were male or female, I would look at the you know courses they took, their experience. Um, if I knew that they were male and female, I would automatically gear towards the female because I know that the majority of my team is already going to be male. And I know bringing in a female and putting a female in the midst of a bunch of men is actually going to be really good because females just think differently. And I think True. it's a, I it's great to have a, a mixture. Like when you have a team, a development team that's 50-50, production is way better than a team of just like 80% men and and less women. Like women bring a different perspective to the table when it comes to thinking logically and women are multitaskers. Men are not great at multitasking and women. Nobody is great at multitasking. Women are a little bit better at multitasking. (laughs) I disagree. No, scientifically proven, nobody is good at multitasking. (laughs) What we're actually doing is we're just switching between tasks really quickly. Yeah. Not multitasking. uh, but I do find that women are a little bit more detail oriented and, and, and mm-hmm. I find that we catch a lot more when we have women on the team. I don't have any problems with that. Like I believe that women do think differently and so on. Mm-hmm. I haven't had a career in tech to comment on what a team diversity would impact results and all of that. But what I can say is that I've seen a post on Twitter of someone that's well respected in tech space actually. And they said that, They've they said that they're tired of the women in tech uh, propaganda. That's what they said. Oh. They said that they've tried hiring women. So there's something that I want you to realize just happened right now. They say that they're tired of hiring women just because they're women. Because most times women get the job just because they're women, not because they're more qualified. And you just said that if there's a candidate in front of you and you don't know male or female, you're going to look at the actual qualifications, the credentials, mm-hmm. the courses, the experience. But if all things being equal and the only differentiator is that one's a male and one's a female, you're going to lead towards the female. And that is because of your, that's just your personal um, preference. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing though, as a black male, if I go to America to study, and this is the problem as Candace Owens always highlights, when I try to, let's say I'm a black American male, I'm not Jamaican, I'm a black, um, black American Afro-American, as they put it. And I apply mm-hmm. to college. And I get into college because they're trying to get more black males into college. Mind you, in my country, I probably should try that because it's like 75% females to males. Trust me, it's crazy. When I get in because of that, it's not based on meritism, right? It's based on social engineering, mm-hmm. which isn't necessarily good for the final outcome. Now, I'm not saying that they're unqualified women in tech or in any space at all. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that if we're going to hire or give opportunity to someone just because we're trying to fit some sort of social construct. And I think this happened in Canada where Trudeau 
had he said that he's going to hire females for his jobs and so on, whatever the case might be. I believe that leaves that gives a suboptimal result. What do you think about that? I'm a little saddened by what you said because mm-hmm. I, I think it's sad because I don't I don't think that I mean I, I want to be careful with what I'm gonna say. Um mm-hmm. yes, I, I, I think there's some truth to what you're saying that some companies are feeling mm-hmm. forced to hiring women. But here's the facts mm-hmm. as well. You can go into large companies now and they they have men and women and the fact is there are women doing roles that men were doing prior to them and they're not getting paid the same amount and 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 okay. women are in leadership positions and are in boardrooms but the pay gap is massive between males and females so yes companies could be hiring women just to say hey we're a diverse company etc cetera, etc cetera. But most of those companies are not paying the women the same amount that they're paying the men. Now, are companies hiring women who are not qualified just because they want to fill that gap? I, I don't know why any company would, would do that. That sounds ridiculous to me. But if they want to go down that path, then make sure that you're, you know, looking at the candidates and hiring someone with experience. You're not just going to hire someone who doesn't know what they're doing just because you're putting on a, a facade or, you know, you want to be that company that's that's diverse. I would hope that companies are putting, you know, they're, they're planning out their HR department and saying, you know, we want to be a 50-50 company, right? So what are the roles that we want males in or females in? Or do we, does that matter? No, okay, but right now, like, let's just use an example. Right now, I could mm-hmm. say that I'm a 80% male-dominated company. And I want to be a 50-50. So as a leader, what I would do, this is just me personally. I'm not telling anybody how to run their business or what to do. But me personally, I would say, okay, I want to get into a point where I'm at 50-50 because it's important to me to have diversity. And diversity for me is not just because I want females on the team because I'm a female. It's because I know that females bring a different perspective to the table. And that's important to me. Mm -hmm. Men are great they're experienced they know what they're doing but we need we need that we need people with different opinions and it's not just about male and female it's also about cultures hiring people from different cultures to come in they just bring different thinking and when you're building tech you want people with sharp minds and you want people with different opinions and 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 different ways of thinking and i think where you have where you have diversity that really helps so for me it would be okay I have, you know, way more male developers than females. So how can I fill in that gap, right? So can I bring in a couple of females to add add to the team? And will, what kind of impact will that have on the team? I have to really analyze that. And what projects are they going to be working on? Or mm-hmm. is it my marketing team where I need more females? Or is it my, um, my, my sales team? You know what I mean? You have to look at all your departments and, and see where having diversity is really going to help you. Now, I might decide that, you know what, my development team works best with just males, but my marketing team works much better with just females. Females are empathetic and they can tell better stories. So that comes across into our our marketing, right? So you have to really look at your company, the layout, and see where uh, where you can add that diversity. Don't force it on your company. Look at your company. Look at the different areas and departments and where can where where will having diversity really bring you an impact, a positive impact. That's what I would do. I like that point. That point where you say that where would diversity bring a positive impact? That's the point that I love. The point yeah. that I don't love is where you say that you might have 80% males and you want to get it to 50-50. That for me is a problem. And I'll tell you why. Let's say that you are at 80% males on your development team. Let's just assume. And as you said, you want to get it to 50-50 females. Do you realize that statistically, in order to get it to 50-50, you're going to have to hire females that are less qualified than their male counterparts, which is what would have happened to me when I got into university because I'm black, not because of my credentials. Remember, they want to get a certain amount of black males into university, so they make it easier for black males to get into university. When my application goes in and they look at my application, uh, what national, um, which ethnicity are you? What's your gender? 
how much money does your family make on average per year? Or oh, less than 50K per year between both parents or only one parent, black male. All right, get them in. Over someone who has done more work, it's not bad, I would think, to give everyone the opportunity to apply for the job, to get the career, which is why I have no problem with um, teaching girls or younger children, female, how to code and so on. Because like I said, I was engaged to someone who finished mm -hmm. summa cum laude in computer science, and she's a kick-ass Python programmer. Hats off to her, even though the relationship ended. But I don't like when we say that we have to meet a certain quota. So let's get in more women in tech. And then when the resumes are on the table, they give a job to a, another woman over a male just because she's a male. Like, it does happen. Like The person on Twitter said that they did that and they were less qualified. Women were less qualified. They had to fire them because they didn't know what they were doing and they had to go to men. It's not my opinion. Someone posted it out of frustration. The other thing that I want you to look at is I'm not saying it doesn't happen because I'm sure there are instances, but statistically, if we look at two job roles, let's say there is a CTO role available for company A and it's 100K per year. And let's say they're going to have two CTOs, however, that's going to work. And one's a male, one's a female. And the male gets paid 100K and the female gets paid 80K, which is what you alluded to, same job, same experience and everything. I don't see why the company would hire the male when they could hire two females and pay them 80k. You get what I'm saying? Well, the role of a CTO is usually just one one role within a company, depending on on the size. Um, I don't I don't know if I agree with you on that one. I think this could be a conversation that could go on Which for one? a long time. <laughs> well, because Which the, the fact the fact Which is one? the fact is a CTO female, if she had the same experience as the male she probably would mm -hmm. start out with a less salary. And I'm talking about the exact same credentials, exact same, no difference. Mm -hmm. And and she's just as capable. Her salary would probably start a little lower unless she's a really good negotiator and, and can and, and can make that up. Sure. But that That's, but the, that. right. But, but then she's gotta she's gotta step up. I mean I think I think this whole conversation that we're having, it, it there's two ways about it, right? There's you know the companies and how much they're willing to be diverse. And when I'm talking about being diverse, I'm not saying that you take a company that has 80% men and now you're saying we're going to eliminate the 80% to make a 50-50. That's not what I was saying. What I'm saying is I'm at 80, my team is growing, and I want to bring in women to add to that to get us to 50-50. So this is as you're hiring. And I don't well, think there's just any... Because you're saying you want to bring in women, why not bring in the best person for the job? And if it's a woman, then it's because a woman. I'm that's because I'm a point. female running a tech company, and I think it's important to have diversity. For me, Fair that's enough. just me personally. Fair yeah, enough. because Fair I know enough. I know how it works to have, I I know the benefits of having f females on on a team, and and it, it just has nothing to do with salary gap or experience. It just has to do with having a diverse team has a lot of benefits. So we can get into those benefits at a di different time, but there are benefits to it, definitely. No, I don't disagree, you know. Like I said, I don't disagree about mm -hmm. that. What I All right, look at it this way. Rem remember you just said that maybe the male is a better negotiator than the female? Yeah. Yeah. And you also mentioned that in, this, in the marketing department, maybe females would do better, better because they're more empathetic, right? Yeah. Do you know the number one determining factor why males make more money than females? Why is that? Well, there are a few, like they tend to do jobs that pay higher. They tend to work longer hours. There's all of that. But at the negotiating table, because men are more prone to be, what's the character trait that I'm looking for? I know the word, disagreeable, mm. right? So I'll give you an example. I was in a negotiation with a client two days ago. We're renewing a contract and the client says, hey, we've done a year. And they want to pay me X amount. Matter of fact, I'm going to use the exact number. They want to pay me 200K per year, per month. That's what they put on the table, 200K. And that's what we did last year, 200K. I want a raise. And I say to them that this is what I want. I want 220K. Both male, the GM and the director. And they said to me that, why should we pay you more when you've already delivered part of the project? And I gave some very explicit reasons. And I say, let's meet at 220K. Do you do realize that it's my disagreeableness why I got that raise? 
I mm-hmm. could have said, you know, you're right. It's only 20K, which is their agreeableness in most women. Oh, you want to go on a date? Where do you want to go? I don't know. All right, let's go to Red Lobster. I don't really want to go to Red Lobster. All right. I think I want to go to Red Lobster. Friday at 7, sure. And they're gone. Agreeableness. It's not because, in my opinion, that they're being malicious against women. There are just some things that's going to determine it. Like I said, men, they tend to work more hours. They tend to take jobs that pay more. And even in the same situation, just because of character traits, there are some things that are going to allow a man to make more money. The other thing I wanted to look at is there is a research that's done in Scandinavia, right, where they give equal opportunity to both men and women, right? So if you want to be a nurse as a man, have at it. And if you want to be a CTO as a woman, have at it. And what they realize is that male-dominated jobs, like engineers, like bricklayers, they continued to be male-dominated. And female-dominated jobs, like nurses, they tend to they continue to be female-dominated. Do you know why so that are you, happened? So are you saying that men work harder than women? If I'm saying that men work harder than women. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Because you're saying men work longer hours. Like, so are you saying that men work harder than women? Let me answer that question with the statistics. With actual, not even statistics, the actual reality of things. Mm-hmm. On average, men work more hours than women. Does that mean they work harder? Because being hard, working harder is subjective. Working more hours, men tend to work more hours. There's also the fact that once a woman hits a certain age, which is they're like companies developed around this, they start to look for partners. They start to look for settling down. And even women who have made partners at some of the biggest law firms in the world, their partners making hundreds of thousands of US dollars per year, they tend to walk away from the career just to have a family. And the reason why they do that is because it's just what they want. As a man, we have no problem working for 20, 30 years 80 hours per week just to make it as a billionaire. That's just how we're wired. It's not nothing, it's not a hit against women, but that's just how we're wired. That is why in Scandinavia, the male-dominated jobs continue to be male-dominated and female-dominated jobs continue to be female-dominated. I'm, I'm not, I, I have no comment on that. <laughs> I'm not going to, I don't think I want to get into that. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> it is what it is. It is what the it is, right? Are, yeah, the thing, you know, is that I don't want to have you on the podcast because I hope I'm not being offensive, but I don't want to no, have listen, you on the podcast. I'm a big believer that everyone's entitled to their opinion. Some people might agree with me or disagree. Some people might agree or disagree with you. We're just having a conversation. Mm-hmm. And that's what I want to have so that yeah. we can put our cards on the table and we can at least understand where each other is coming from. Because like I said, and I'll continue to reiterate, I don't think that women in tech is a bad thing. I don't think that women doing a male-dominated job is a bad thing. Like I grew up with a single mom. My mother fathered me. But I do also have to accept that there are reasons why there are more bricklayers as men than there are women. But nobody talks about that. There are more engineers as men than there are women. You know, there's reasons to all of that. But nobody wants to have that conversation. Most times, I'm just hoping that we could have it. We are. We are. It's just, it's such a sensitive topic. And it's so, it's such an uh, opinionated topic that it can get really sensitive at times. So I always try to be really careful because if I answer everything that, that you've made comments on, I'm going to go defend, I'm going to go on the defensive because I am a female, right? And I disagree with a lot of what you're saying. Uh, But, you know, I'm like, I have to pick my battles. That's just how life is. I have. I have to figure out what are the right battles for me and which ones do I want to battle and which ones I'm going to say, I'm just going to let that go for now. <laughs> and you see, that's the difference between a male and a female, because if you were a male, hell no, I'm not letting him get away with that disagreeableness all over again. You know, there's a reason why we don't want males most time to be rearing young children, right? Oh, this baby just won't shut up. That doesn't work for a baby. You need to be more yeah. empathetic. You need to be more nurtured. Yeah. Yeah, so something else that I want to touch on, and Mm -hmm. this is also going to be a sensitive topic, perhaps podcast. And um, breast cancer. I think you should call those. I think you should call this podcast sensitive topics. (laughs) Yeah, I know, right? Sensitive topics with a woman in tech. I I think this should work. (laughs) But like, um, breast cancer survival, Mm -hmm. and this is one that touches home for anyone who knows my story. My mom died of metastatic colon ah. cancer, 
right? And most people don't know this, but when she was diagnosed, she had a support group and her support group was made up of two breast cancer survivors, mind you. It might have been three because there were four women and I know two of them personally. Women I talked mm-hmm. to very well, they were breast cancer survivors. And I know that this is a growing concern, health, especially since COVID-19 came just the other day. And we've been talking about vaccines and are they healthy and healthy mm. living. If you go into the health space, there's a lot of money to be made, which shows that there is a general interest. What was your experience going through this and what kept you going so you could um, recover? Is that the best way to put it? Yeah, From I such guess. a major yeah. illness? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean... Honestly, I think the best thing I did when I got diagnosed, I, when I got diagnosed with breast cancer, I was actually just taking over. I was on a founding team of a product called Menusano, and the whole team had, had left and I had been left alone with this product. And I was on the midst of relaunching this, this startup and I got diagnosed and I made the decision to not take any time off and continue working during my, my journey. So obviously I, I had four surgeries, so I had to take time off for, for the surgeries and stuff, but I kept working. And I think for me personally, that's just, again, me, it, it might not work for everyone else. I was able to continue working, whether I had days where I worked from home, but having, being, having, uh, having a, a, a routine, uh, getting up and getting dressed and going to the office and having a purpose gave, kept me going. It gave me something to look forward to, and it was a challenge. I mean, I love challenges in general, but Mm -hmm. it kept me going. And I mean, I had a lot of highs and I had a lot of lows, and the lows were were really low. And there was times where there was times where I had to slow down and just, you know, today my body feels. I had to honor my my body a lot, and I had to say, you know, today Mm -hmm. I'm just not in a good place, and I'm just I need to just be in bed all day. So I had to be very intuitive with my my body. But I think the best thing I did was honestly, like, I, I continued working, which kept me around people because I also live alone, right? So what am I going to do? Mm-hmm. Be at home for two years by myself? That's not that's not healthy. Uh, I needed mental yeah. stimulation, right? So I think that's mm-hmm. sort of that. That was what really kept me going. Obviously, my friends and family uh, was helpful. But, like, the mm-hmm. best decision that I made at the time was to continue working. And that just, that worked for me. It, it worked out. You know, I would, my, the hospital is just up the, up, up a walk from my office. So I was able to go back and forth and it just really gave me purpose. That sounds good. And it reminds me of a story that I read in Think and Grow Rich. You, you would never mm. believe the story is actually there. You read I've the read book, that book. Yeah. Yes. Do you remember the story of the gentleman who was going into surgery? And when he was going into surgery, he was literally half dead going in. <laughs> Yeah. And he said to a friend that I will see you shortly. The doctors will take care of me. And the yeah. doctor said that the only reason why he survived was because he decided that he was going to survive. He actually, it's amazing that I'm going to say this, but his mental decision to stay alive, to make it yeah. through surgery was what the doctor said brought him through. And here you're yeah. saying that you accepted it for what it was. You knew that there were things that you wanted to achieve and you wanted to continue to do in life. And I think maybe that's also a big part of what you got through. What do you think? Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. I know that for a fact. I think that mm-hmm. I'm just a, I'm I'm just not built that way. If I had just taken time off and stayed home and did nothing, I would have mentally gotten depressed and wow. I think that would have had a negative impact on my body and you know all the treatments mm-hmm. and stuff I was doing. I don't think that would have been good for me. I know myself, right? I'm I'm in tune with my body. I just don't don't think that I'm I just I I'm I can't, I can't be that person sitting around doing nothing. So keeping myself busy was, was great. You mentioned that if you had stayed home all this time, you would have been mentally depressed. And that's something I wanted to touch on. How did Mm -hmm. you cope with the emotional strain of being (sighs) ill with such a major illness? And didn't you at times, this is a sensitive question, but I have to ask because someone could be listening, faced with a similar situation and they're looking for answers. Didn't you also at time feel afraid that maybe this was going to be it? Oh, yeah, for sure. When I first got diagnosed, I, I got my affairs in order. I, I got my will done. Uh, I prepared to die because I didn't know 
what stage I was. I didn't know if it was curable. You don't find out right away. So I got my affairs in order because I didn't want to be a burden for my family if I died. So for until after my surgery and they sent my sample, I had lymph nodes removed and they sent everything off. It took a couple of weeks for me to find out that I was stage one and that um, my lymph nodes were, were clean. It had not spread and that I was going to live. I until that point, I thought I was going to die. I just didn't know. I think that's natural for people who get a cancer diagnosis to, to have the first mm -hmm. thought be, I'm going to die. You know, it's it's the C word, yeah. right? Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, first, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about death. Mm -hmm. And um, how did you cope with all the mental strain and even the grim possibility of passing on and stuff like that? What, what are some of the things that you did? Well, I went to therapy. Ooh, that's and nice. uh, yeah, I, I did. I'm still in therapy six years later. Um, therapy was mm -hmm. really good because it helps you um, build coping mechanisms for your feelings okay. and what you're dealing with. So that was really helpful. I also started uh, journaling and just meditating. Journaling really helps me just get my thoughts down and, and process information. And meditation... Mm -hmm taught me how to shut my brain off because that's something I really struggled with was sleep Yeah. because my brain just wouldn't mm. shut up. It was going, going, hey. going, and I would have this thought and that thought. And I remember getting to a point where I was like, brain, please, can you just shut up? I just, it just wouldn't stop. Yeah. yeah. So meditation kind of helped me with that um, so that I could start at least getting some sleep. And it took me, honestly, it took me years to get to a point where I was getting six to seven hours of sleep. And sometimes I still struggle. Sleep is something that I really have to constantly be working on. I have a nighttime routine. It takes me a long time to shut off my brain. So during cancer, it was heightened because of the breast mm, cancer. So, many more so things, it was yeah. on, it was like on overload. So I really struggled with that during that time. So you mentioned you're still in therapy six years later. Um, learning meditation also helped you. Um, were there any lifestyle changes that you had to employ? Did you, yeah. um, please? Well, at first I wanted to go crazy and like exercise mm -hmm. and do all this stuff. But I learned very quickly that my body at the time just couldn't handle it. And I yeah. had to teach myself to be kind to myself because I was being really hard on myself. I wanted control over my body. Mm -hmm. And that is the one thing that you don't have when you go through cancer. I mean, I'm sure you witnessed it with your mother, right? So the one thing that I was able to have control over was my diet, what I put in my body. Because exercise wasn't something I could do because I had, I had so many surgeries. My body was physically was ill. So yeah, so I, I, I did a lot of walking. That was something I could do. But really what I went to was diet. What, what am I putting in my body? What kind of ingredients am I buying? Uh, what kind of junk am I putting in my body? You know, how can I uh, make that better? So I started eating, you know, like organic and um, mm -hmm. grass, grass fed and just looking, really looking deep into ingredients and sodium levels and sugar. Sugar is really bad for cancer, right? So I started just doing a lot of work around. I mean, Menusano, the, one of the businesses that I'm the founder of is a nutrition analysis software which is the one that I relaunched Ooh. during um, during my cancer journey. So it, I was already mm -hmm. passionate about nutrition and because I, I had the startup that was in nutrition. So it sort of helped me even with my own journey on figuring out how to eat healthy and, and, and have a little control over my body. The diet part really made me feel like I, I was physically doing something for myself. That was good. So Menusano is a company that you founded that is based on tech software that helps with nutrition. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so it's actually for the food service industry. So it's business to business. Mm -hmm. It's a nutrition analysis mm -hmm. software that allows food manufacturers to get nutrition labels for their products. And then companies mm -hmm. like restaurants and pizza shops can uh, put the calories on their menus for when uh, customers are wow. going in to eat. So in mm -hmm. Canada and the U.S., health bills are, um, you know, really over budget and diabetes is a global pandemic now. So a lot of mm -hmm. governments are trying to figure out 
how can they help people with diabetes live healthy mm-hmm. with you can't cure diabetes but you can live a healthy lifestyle and how you how can you mm-hmm. prevent diabetes so nutrition labeling is becoming like a massive thing in North America to see if they can help with the the diabetes problem so uh, a lot of governments are making it mandate to have label changes and put calories on menus and things like that. So the food service industry in order to go through these processes it can take a lot of time. Sending food to a lab is really expensive. Mm-hmm. And so we wanted to solve that problem with technology. And so we provide a platform where they can go in. We work with government source data. So in Canada we use the CFIA, in the US we use the USDA. We also uh, do labeling in the UK and we're uh, launch, we're going to be launching into Central America this year. Um, and so we're, we're working with yeah, your public audience health. Bad. Oh, your audience is going bad. Can you hear me? It might be the internet. Um, did you lose me? Yeah. Can you hear me so now? Yes. Yeah, kind of better. It's like I was hearing something humming in the background. Oh, it could be, there's some construction happening here. Okay. Let's continue and let's hope okay. it doesn't mess yeah. up the audio in the actual recording. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so um, uh, taking sending government. for, sorry, go ahead. I, I you, you were saying that the government, TIFA, I believe it was, is where you get the information. Yeah. And then, yeah, in Canada, we have the CFIA. In the U.S., we work with the USDA to get all mm-hmm. of the compliant labels. We use their databases. So we provide software where companies can go in, create their recipes, create their, their own uh, custom ingredients, and then we provide compliant labels for each country that they can print out and put on their labelings and things like that. And it saves them hundreds and hundreds of dollars. And someone listening would like to use your software, they would like to sign up. How do they get in touch? How do they get started? Yeah, they can go to our website. It's menusano.com. So M-E-N-U-S-A-N-O.com. And all our contact mm-hmm. information is on there. And then they, they can reach out to me and I'll help them through the process. And how would they reach out to you, Sonia, if they would like to reach out? Yeah, they can email me. So sonia.kuro at menusano.com. Perfect. Uh, we will have the links in the description. And as you re- repeated them just now, we're going to have the cards come up on screen in what's called a lower third. So anyone mm-hmm. watching or listening will be able to get in contact. They will be able to get um, signed up to Menusano as well. And they can go from there. Yeah. How did you enjoy your time on the Boardroom Podcast today? I enjoyed it. It was fun. We had a great conversation. (laughs) Yes, I um, I believe that conversation like this is important. Yeah. If we can just you know be open and be honest, see where each other is coming from, and at least try to understand each other. Um, it is our tradition on the Boardroom Podcast that whenever a guest has been on, they've had a good time. We like to ask them the question, given you've had a good time on the Boardroom Podcast, who is one guest that you would love to see on the podcast in the future? And for this guest, what is one question that you would like us to ask them for you? Oh, gosh, I can't think of anybody out of the top of my head. Um, Mm. I don't know. That's a tough question. I wish you had asked me ahead of time. I would have really put some thought into it. Um, I don't know. You could be someone from South. Or tech could be another woman in tech. Yeah, I don't know who be... off the top of my head, but I mean, I would love mm-hmm. if you had another woman in tech and you get into the conversation that you and I had uh, and, and 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 talking about like the diversity on a team. I'd love to see mm-hmm. a different a, a different opinion. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I do think you know I do we... think it would be good to have more of these conversations versus just you know forcing it on people and saying you have to have a diverse team you you should be doing this you should be doing that and but having conversations and seeing what people how people really feel about it right proposal yeah what if what if myself yourself and a few other selves in the space Mm -hmm. of tech let's just do it for tech for now and we'll try to have a balanced panel two males two females preferably in either project management or CTO or hiring roles. Like they have those roles, they've overseen teams. We just have a panel discussion with four of you guys on, and we just talk about the pros and cons and the best way to go about diversifying the gender in tech. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. 
I think that's something we should do because at the yeah. end of the day, what we would learn is different opinions on what's a sensitive topic. And I, like I said, mm. and I'm going to say it again, ad nauseum, I don't think it needs to be sensitive. And yeah. I don't think that women in tech or in brick lane is a bad thing. Because like mm-hmm. I said, again and again, my ex fiance summa cum laude, in the space, um, in the computer science department in her year. And she shared that space with another female who was her best friend. And they're very good, excellent yeah. at what. So um, I think this is a conversation that we should have. And I'd like to invite you on for that panel discussion in very short Sure. Order. What are your thoughts? Yeah, let's for sure. I think that's then. great. Yeah, let's get it done. Let's get it done. Thank you for your time, Sonia. Today has been wonderful. I like that we could agree, disagree, and agree to disagree <laughs> on some topics. I also loved your story about breast cancer. I'm hoping that there's someone listening. And if you're going through a tough time, I want you to understand that this is not the end. Cancer is not a death sentence. Just mm-hmm. do what you need to do to take care of yourself. Live differently than you've lived before because it's the way you've lived before that's caused yeah. you to be sick right now. And embrace positivity, embrace healing, and decide to live. Thank you for your time, yeah. Sonia. Thank you. I appreciate it. Cheers.